as we are and invites us to a life of repentance where we can name the broken places and grow ever more near to the one ready to forgive. Will you pray with me? Have mercy on us, Lord Jesus. The lives of all your creatures on this earth have been disrupted. We cannot take back what we have said or undo what we have done or make up for the agony we have caused others. We are haunted by the past, plagued by the present, and fearful of the future. Yet the faith you have planted in us reaches out for your favor, returns to your presence, and hungers for your mercy. Have mercy on us, Lord Jesus. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Christ loves us and invites us to be made new. In Christ there is hope for new life, and in his name we are forgiven. Praise be to God. Amen. Jesus Christ, and welcome to this streaming service of worship brought to you by First Presbyterian Church. A very special word of welcome to those joining with us at 11 a.m. over radio station WCHE. And um, this is the time in a service where we would typically have, have just passed the peace. And so I invite you to do something today. Um, if you are watching with us over Facebook, leave a, a, pass, a peace greeting in the comments. And if you are, what, are participating over the radio or over our streaming service through the website, take a moment and text somebody in your life who you want to say peace be with you. So if you have a college student that is headed down to school, if you have a parent um, who's far away, um, take a moment and just reach out to them. Or if you are sitting near your family, give them a little hug and kiss and tell them and give them the peace of Christ. Um, we have many things going on in the life of our congregation, just a few to bring to your attention today. The first is our first porch initiative. Um, this is a way for those of you who are longing to see your church family face to face to do so in a very small, a very, very small group at an outdoor location for a time of fellowship. Um, we are recruiting hosts at the moment, so if you want to host one of these gatherings at, at an outdoor location of your choosing, or if you feel more comfortable doing so over Zoom, sign up online, or you can, um, can contact Elizabeth Hess to serve as a host. This morning we have a prayer initiative for our pastoral transition. We'll be praying for elements of that um, search, for our interim search, for members of the transition team. If you would like to join us over Zoom, that will begin at 1015, and the link to join can be found at www.firstpreswc, so just our homepage, backslash live, L-I-V-E. Our Helping Hands ministry continues. It is active. We're looking for both people who need a little help and those who have a little help to give. Um, go to our sign-up page on our website. And uh, finally, this morning, we are blessed with um, a preacher from who many of you know very well, our Director of Christian Education, Sarah Pantazis. Um, Sarah has a degree in um, Christian Education from Union Seminary. She is a gifted speaker and preacher um, and a delightful person, and so I'm so glad that she'll be able to gift us with her, um, with God's Word this morning. She's also asking for you to send her a picture. Um, if you are a parent in the congregation, send her a little picture of your children. She's working on a special back-to-school project. So um, if you, if you w are willing to do so, send her that and more to come on that project. We will continue our worship with the reading from Scripture. 
Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities.
we come into this time of prayer, I have some sad news to share with our church family. We received word yesterday that our long, long time church member, our beloved Dan Kohler, passed away after a motorcycle accident in, near his home in Guatemala. Dan grew up at First Pres. He has always been an active participant in Sunday worship, often emailing us from his home near Antigua to say, hey, I'm watching with you, I'm watching online. He's an active, um, he was connected with our sister church, Iglesia Gethsemane, and his mother, Connie, is a um, deacon and one of our, um, and just cares for everyone who she sees. Our hearts are breaking for Connie, for her daughter Audrey, and for um, all those who know and love Dan. We'll keep you informed about arrangements for celebrating his life, but in the meantime, please keep, um, please keep Connie and Audrey and all who love him in your prayers. Will you pray with me? Merciful God, in love you created us, and in love you sustain us from our first breath until our days on this earth are done. In confidence, we bring our prayers to you, knowing that you will hear and respond. In this time of distance, we pray for those estranged from family, friends, or neighbors due to illness or broken relationships. We pray for those who are struggling to find connection in a world that seeks to divide us and peace in a world filled with pain. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those struggling under the weights of fear or regret for something they did or for something they neglected to do. We pray for all that is unfinished and unresolved, that those pieces might be caught up in your care, and that we learn to live as forgiven people in the midst of all that is broken in our lives and in the world. We pray for those who find themselves far from you, who struggle with doubts and disillusionment, and for forgiveness for the way that your church has so often betrayed you and your children. We pray for your courage to move forward in humility and hope. We pray for our world, for Lebanon and India, for Yemen and for the Uyghur people in China for all who have lived so long with violence that they have only distant memories of peace, and for those for whom death and destruction has recently burst into their lives. We pray for Connie, and for Audrey, for all who love Dan Kohler, and with trust in the resurrection that he is united with you and with all of those saints who have gone before him. We pray for our nation groaning under violence, injustice, and division, and for our connections to be stronger than that which divides us. God, we pray for teachers, parents, and children struggling to learn and to find safety and routine in days of uncertainty, for all who are in the position of making impossible decisions, and for children who are already struggling with poverty and homes filled with fear. Help us to make new paths and to guide us when we don't know the way forward. Be with parents sending their children off to college and keep them and all safe from harm. God, we lift these prayers and all of those held in the silence of our hearts up to you, the light before us, and the breath surrounding us this day and evermore. We ask this all in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us how to live and love and pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, our lives are not our own, neither is anything in them. All that we are and all that we have comes from the one who gives all and invites us to give our very lives as an offering of gratitude. Let us give our gifts to God.
you pray with me? We praise you, O God, for all that you give us, from the breath that fills our lungs to the people who show us your presence in the world. May these gifts we bring be a sign of faith and trust in you. Use them for your glory to feed the hungry, to bring good news to the suffering, and to spread your good news to all who long to hear it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Matthew 15, 10 through 28. Then he called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, Are you still also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds the heart, and that is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Matthew fifteen ten through 28. Good morning, church. Will you pray with me? Sustaining God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, open our minds and our hearts to your word of love, mercy, healing, and blessing, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. My first semester at college was rough. I was only an hour from home, and I was at the school I wanted to be at, but nevertheless, that season of change in my life was deeply unsettling for me. And my family knew this, so they got in the habit of sending me cards and postcards with words of love and encouragement. And the message of one of those cards struck me as so true that I still have it to this day. The card shows a rope hanging over a patch of thorns and a little girl hanging onto the bottom of the rope. And the caption says, when you reach the end of your rope, tie a knot in it and hang on. I think that that image and those words have stayed with me for so long because sometimes life gives us no choice but to grin and bear it. And I think that quite a few of us have been dangling from our ropes for quite a while now. For some of us, you might be more comfortable than others. Maybe you have a seat at the bottom of your rope that you can rest on as you dangle above the thorns. But for others, your arms are getting tired your palms may be sweaty and blistering, and maybe even the rope itself is starting to fray, dropping you ever closer and closer to the thorns. This time that we are living through has tried us in so many ways, and it seems like there is no end in sight. And the pain that we are feeling, be it physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual, is real. However, I hope that when you look to the future, you don't just see darkness and that you don't just feel despair. Because as people of faith, we are also people of hope. In Romans chapter 5, Paul writes that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. We are people of hope who can look at the world and say, no, this is not how God intended it to be. God is not done working with us, the story is still being written, and God is with us, transforming us and moving us ever closer to God's kingdom on earth. Where did this vision of the future come from? And how can we be so certain that God has not abandoned us, especially in times when nothing feels certain? Well, I hope the answer is kind of obvious. 
It's Jesus. In the gospel passage that we are looking at today, we pick up right in the middle of the gospel long story of Jesus's ministry. Jesus is well underway, his disciples and the crowds following along behind, witnessing the healings and the miracles and trying to make sense of all the teachings. I wonder sometimes if in the thick of it, they could appreciate the history that they were living through. If they could see how Jesus was turning what they thought they knew about the world upside down in order to build something different. And I wonder if you can see that that is still what God is doing in the world right now. Jesus is still working through all of us who wrestle to understand who Jesus was and what he means for our world. And I think today the message for us can be summed up in just two words. Think bigger. At the beginning of this chapter, the Pharisees and the scribes come to Jesus. They are so bothered that they leave Jerusalem and go to where Jesus is to ask him, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Now, washing hands before eating was a religious tradition for the Jews that was treated as having equal authority as the law. So this was a big deal to them. And Jesus' response to them essentially was, you think that washing hands is important? That has absolutely nothing to do with whether you are clean or unclean before God. He trivializes and dismisses their concerns and walks away. Now imagine if Jesus showed up to us today and said, don't say the Lord's Prayer anymore or any of those creeds. They're not getting you anywhere with me. This was that kind of moment for the Pharisees and the disciples. Now imagine if you were told that you can't gather in person for church, or that maybe you can, but only in very small groups, and you can't sing together. Well, we don't have to imagine how that feels. We are painfully aware. You would say, what? No, these are the things that we do to help us to stay close to God. They are important. They are biblical. This is the way people have always worshiped God. And as he walked away, you would scramble after and you'd say, no, Jesus, wait, you have to give us more. Help us to understand. So Jesus does, because Jesus is thinking bigger and he wants to bring us along with him. So here's his explanation in verse 18. He says, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. What's important here, Jesus says, isn't what literally goes in and comes out of your body. It's not about food, it's about words. Words, Jesus wants us to understand, come from the heart. We might not use the words clean and unclean to describe the state of our heart these days, but I think if we frame it a little differently, we'll know exactly what Jesus meant. So let me ask this question. How is your heart feeling these days? For many of us, we might not feel unclean, but we probably feel anxious, unsettled, stressed. And when that is what's inside of us, it inevitably comes out of us. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. A couple of months back, I shared on Facebook a conversation that my nine-year-old son and I had, which just seemed to perfectly summarize how life was feeling at that point. And frankly, it kind of still does. So my, mom, my son said to me, I love you, Mommy. And so I responded, I love you too, sweetheart, even when I am tired and cranky and grouchy. To which he responded, which is often these days. We were both speaking our truths. <laughs> None of us want to be cranky or snippy with our children, with our partners, or with the people who fill our lives with joy and meaning. But I suspect that in the past few months, most of us have in one way or another, because it is hard to hold negativity and frustration and exhaustion inside of ourselves. And that is what so many of us have been carrying. 
Jesus is teaching the disciples that the state of our heart matters. It affects our relationship to our ability to be in relationship with others and to be in relationship with God. It makes sense, but it leaves me wondering, what about when we can't help it? The state of our country and our world today is incredibly worrying. It's important that we pay attention and completely natural that we would feel concerned. And what about people who experience anxiety or depression? Or people responsible for caring for the long-term illness or disability of a loved one? What about people living with grief? Sometimes our worlds are gray. Sometimes they are dark gray. And that's okay. The question is, what does God expect of us then? What do we do with those times when what comes out of our mouth just isn't great and we feel like there's nothing we can do to change it? When our worlds are shaky and uncertain and our hearts are unsettled, where does that leave us with God? And how do we possibly find the capacity in those times to think bigger? Several years ago, memoirist Anne Lamott published a short book titled Help, Thanks, Wow, in which she suggests that those are the only three prayers that we will ever need. Did you catch them? Help, thanks, and wow. In the first chapter, she describes the stories of many different people of all different religious and faith backgrounds who all find themselves in a place in life where all they can say is help. And she wrote, <clears throat> praying help means that we ask that something give us the courage to stop in our tracks right where we are and turn our fixation away from the knot of our problems. We stop the toxic peering and instead turn our eyes to something else, to our feet on the sidewalk, to the middle distance, to the hills from whence our help comes, someplace else, anything else. Maybe this is a shift of only eight degrees, but it can be a miracle. It may be one of those miracles where your heart sinks because you think it means that you have lost, but in surrender, you have won. Let me say that again. In surrender, you have won. Friends, Jesus cares about the state of our heart. He knows that we can't will it into obedience to God and peaceful harmony in a world that is anything but. But we can try to see past our present difficulties to future promise. We can choose what we put into our lives. I'm talking about relationships, social media, the news, books, music, activities. We can choose to be intentional to choose things that point us in the directions of grace and hope. We can choose to ask God for help. And maybe, hopefully, from this posture of humility, we can begin to think bigger. <clears throat> Let's return to Jesus and the disciples, because one of the things that I love about Jesus is, is that he doesn't just teach, he shows. So after talking with the Pharisees, Jesus and the disciples left that place and they journeyed to the land of Tyre and Sidon. And this was the land of the Canaanites, who were the ancestral enemies of the Jews, going all the way back to the time of Moses. And not long after they get there, a Canaanite woman comes up to them and starts shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David! My daughter is tormented by a demon. See, even in enemy territory, Jesus' reputation preceded him. Even though Jesus had never been there before, she knew that she was coming to a representative of the divine, pleading the desperate prayer, prayer of a parent who is despairing over the well-being of her child. When this mother says, have mercy on me, that word mercy translates into help, like Anne Lamott bottom of your rope, God, please help. But she came to Jesus with more than desperation. She also came with faith. By calling Jesus son of David, she acknowledges Jesus as the Messiah of the Israelite people. She knows where he and she stands within their time's socio-political landscape, and it is not together. 
And for us, the phrase son of David can serve as a kind of hyperlink to jump our minds back to the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, which begins an account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David. This Canaanite woman knows that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah and that she is not seen as part of his people. But do you know who else is mentioned in that genealogy? Three women, Ruth, Tamar, and Rahab. And all of them were Canaanites, just like this woman. So the history of where Jesus came from is also, in some small way, the history of where this woman came from. And I think that Jesus understands that she is challenging him right off the bat to see her as connected to him, even though their world didn't see it that way. She was thinking bigger. <coughs> the other part that is striking about her opening line is the word, Lord. <coughs> Did you know that our one English word, Lord, is translated from multiple words in Greek and Hebrew? And as is often the case, things are lost in translation. Here, the word this Canaanite woman uses is kurios, which means master, to whom a person or thing belongs, about which he has the power of deciding. And although the implication of master might have negative connotations for us and our place in history, the Canaanite woman was using it intentionally to put herself in a position of belonging to Jesus. She is indirectly asking him to accept his lordship of her, his position as her master. <coughs> Excuse me. Can you see how she has come out swinging? She comes to him thinking bigger, hoping that he'll come through. Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. And then we are off to the races in a back and forth that has caused scholars and faithful people no end of heartache for centuries because the response of not just the disciples but of Jesus is awful. <coughs> the disciples dismiss her out of hand asking Jesus to get rid of her because she's bothering them. And Jesus' response is that he's there to help the people of Israel and no one else. So the woman repeats her plea, Lord, help me. And once again, we hear the cry of a breaking heart that has nowhere else to turn and won't give up. And then Jesus kind of pours salt on the wound by saying, it's not fair to take the children's food and give it to the dogs. <coughs> Scholars have lots of opinions on the implication of the word dog, but the bottom line is it's an insult. But once again, the woman persists, and she effectively says, yes, maybe the Jews are more important to you than I am, but even a crumb of your power is enough to heal my daughter, and I'll take it. The persistence of this woman is what originally drew me to this passage. Women don't get to speak much in most Bible stories, but in this one, her voice is prominent and strong. She insists that Jesus doesn't need to look at this situation through a lens of frugality because she already knows that God operates from a place of abundance. She knows that God is bigger. God is bigger than the scandal of a woman talking to a man, and God is bigger than the centuries of bad blood between the Jews and the Canaanites. No matter what divisions and limitations we may have here on earth, God is bigger. And what is Jesus' response? Woman, great is your faith. With an exclamation point. <coughs> if with her first words she asks Jesus if he will accept his lordship over her, then he answers her question here. Yes to your faith. Yes, to your belief in me as your Lord, and to your belief in your importance to God and me. The world may have drawn lines between us, but we see you, and we love you, and we belong to each other. And oh, by the way, your daughter is healed. Go and see my power at work for yourself. It's so like I said earlier, Jesus practices what he preaches. If in the first part of this passage he says, let go, of what you think you know, and focus on your heart, 
and how what's in your heart prompts you to move and be in this world. Then in verse 21, he says to the disciples, let me show you. <coughs> the words of Jesus turning the woman away are the words of this world, not of an expansively loving and almighty God. We're uncomfortable with how these words, with how these words sounds because we hear them as exclusionary and unmerciful and unloving. It's not what we want to hear from God. It's not what we believe God says to us. But it is how we act too often. We draw all kinds of lines between ourselves and other people based on where we live, our religious practices, how we vote, our skin color, our language. Jesus says, let it go. Loosen your grip on what you think you know about yourselves and about other people and the ways that it drives you apart. Open your heart. I am bigger. Let me change you and show you another way. I wonder what limits you have in your life. What limits your understanding of God? You might not even see them as limits. Sometimes we can't see things that way until they are broken down and God starts building something new back up. <coughs> what might it look like to see the world through the lens of God's bigger? It has been a great privilege for me to lead two of the book studies that our church has done this summer for people who wanted to learn more about racism and its effects on themselves and on our country. And both of the books that we've been reading offer a profoundly different definition of racism than many of us thought we knew going into them. Many of us think about that word as being applied to an individual, but the authors assert that the word racism or racist is actually best applied to systems, to broader structures of power in our society that work for the benefit of one racial group over another. <laughs> And if this definition is new to you, I know that it's a lot to wrap your head around. So let me offer one brief historical example. Some of you may remember or have learned about poll taxes, which was a tax that an individual had to pay before registering to vote. Several states put poll taxes into effect in the late 19th century as part of the rise of Jim Crow. They were designed to keep African Americans from voting, and they worked. Poll taxes were an example of a racist system that privileged one racial group over another. <clears throat> the books that we are reading here at church this summer speak more directly to the racist systems at work in our country today, and it's incredibly eye-opening. And what so many of you in those groups have shared is, I didn't know. I didn't know the system that I was part of. I didn't know that I was being neutral and that by doing so, I was perpetuating systems that were and still are hurting people. I didn't know. And what I'm then hearing people in these groups say is, but I'm ready to learn. I'm ready to begin acknowledging that I have been part of the problem so that I can start learning how to be part of the solutions. But it's really hard. Throughout our discussions over the last few weeks, people have shared feelings of horror, of sadness, of guilt, of despair. And it takes courage to confront emotions this strong and to not walk away. But in doing so, in persisting, our eyes are opening to see the world not just from our perspective, not just in the ways that we were taught, but to see bigger. Racism is bigger and more present than many of us knew. But now that we are seeing it, we are hoping to become better allies and to find a healing way forward to help change what is causing harm and work to build a more just existence for black, indigenous people of color. And even though it is and will continue to be really hard, we can lean, maybe more than ever before, on our faith. That's what the many people who have been doing this work for centuries have done. Because God is both with us and ahead of us, just waiting for us to become aware and help bring bigger to life in our world. 
We are moving into an election season. We are wrestling with the effects of an awakening consciousness to systemic racism. And COVID, <laughs> we still have COVID. And those are just some of the challenges that we are facing at a collective macro level. Each of you know full well what your personal struggles are. They are hard, they are real, and it is maddening that we can't be together to share our burdens right now. But I have one more story to share, a story of God doing something beautiful, of opening my eyes to bigger in the midst of us not being together. The Pharisees had strict ideas of what it looked like to follow God. We saw that in the beginning of today's passage. And although we might not like the comparison, the same thing could be said of us. Before the pandemic, our denomination held very strongly to the directive in the Book of Order that said communion must be done as a gathered body, together, in person. And then we had to let that go. And the pastors of each church were allowed to say that wherever you are, with whatever version of the elements you have before you, that is the body and blood of Christ. The presence of the risen Lord intimately with you, connecting you to the body of believers through the Holy Spirit. And I don't know what that has looked like for you, but for me, it meant giving my son a piece of crumbly, fresh-from-the-oven scone and a small cup of orange juice, and watching him lick his finger and go back to his plate again and again and again to gobble up every crumb and washing it down with every single drop of juice. And all I could think as I watched him was, Lord, let him always be this hungry for you. That wouldn't have happened before. As we live through these times, knowing that we want God's bigger but often having no idea how to get there. I encourage you to remember these words spoken recently by a pastor in Washington, D.C., who is working to help his church think bigger. He said, hope is a discipline. Hope is a practice. It's important to fight for hope. When your world feels like it's closing in, think bigger. Or if you can't think, just pray for bigger. And if you can find moments of strength, ask yourself how, in the midst of being broken down, God is calling you toward bigger. And may the God who is big enough to create, sustain, and redeem all of creation hold you and fill you and inspire you today and always. Amen.
As Caroline said earlier, my title is not pastor, it's director of Christian education. So you'll have to forgive me if I take advantage of this opportunity to give you some homework. That's right, you heard me, I'm giving you homework. A few minutes ago, I asked you what limits your understanding of God. And I asked you to consider how you might be seeing God's bigger in the world around you. And those are genuine questions. I really want to know your answers. So your homework is to take a few minutes to think about your response and then send it to me. You can mail me a note here at church, you can email me, or you can even call me. Let me know what you have seen or felt falling away and what God is building up bigger in its place. Tell me how you have seen God's bigger and together we can bear witness to the work of our almighty God. And now people of God, remember the words of the woman, Lord, help me. And remember Jesus' words in return, great is your faith. Keep fighting for hope and go with confidence that God is intimately with you and loving you today and always, amen.